Thank you very much, um, Doron. I think I can start speaking, um, which I'm very happy to do. And let me start by th saying thank you very, very much to the National Library for inviting me and allowing me to talk about whatever I wanted to talk about. I can assure you it's a very weird experience to talk to so many people at the same time all over the globe, among whom some really dear old friends. So but I'm going to introduce myself nevertheless, um, even to you, Carla, in Toronto. It's very, very nice to see you in Brenda in Amsterdam. Well, everybody. Um, I, I was asked to very briefly introduce myself, which I will be happy to do. Um, my home base is in Amsterdam, where we have a small, but I would say very vibrant department of Hebrew and Jewish studies with a BA program and an MA program in Jewish studies and intellect, uh, in international English language program, actually. Um, together with my two colleagues, um, we supervise about 10 PhDs. And on average, I would say our specializations are Dutch Jewish history. I think being based in Amsterdam, that's what you're obliged uh, to do. And uh, another very strong emphasis is intellectual history and cultural history of medieval and early modern modern Judaism, especially, but not only in Europe. Um, and within that very broad range, my particular niche is intellectual history. And what I really am interested in, and those colleagues who are here who know me will, I hope, recognize it. I'm interested to know what Jews think and thought. And that sounds easier than it is. There's a, one of my favorite plays is Danton's Tod by Georg Büchner, who says, if you really want to know what somebody thinks, thinks or has thought, you simply have to chop off his head. I mean, this play was called Danton's Tod. And you have to pull out the brain, look at it, and you know what somebody will think. And that is basically what I try to do in my own writing of intellectual history. I don't chop off heads literally, but I try to dissect the heads very, very carefully. And one way of doing that, and now I'm going to share my screen, one way of doing that is looking at getting close to people's brains is looking how they write and think and speak about language. And that is what I will be talking to you today about, about how one, very special brain, maybe one of the greatest brains of all times, wrote and thought and possibly spoke about language. That person was Baruch Spinoza, well, not really Baruch, maybe better, Benedictus Spinoza, who posthumously, he, who wrote a grammar which was published after his death, uh, which may have not entirely been a grammar. So that's the first, uh, I needed three sheets to print my title on this PowerPoint. The first is a grammar that's not a grammar. Here you see the publication, here you see the, um, the, 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 the piece in the um, posthumous works of 1677, not published by Spinoza, but by his close friends. It's not called a grammar, it's called a compendium, grammatices. Grammatices is a very weird Latin form. So I'm going to talk about a grammar that's not a grammar, about, a language which, according to Spinoza, was not really a language, at least not a language that he wanted to write, not a grammar about. I'll come back to this later. And of course, Spinoza himself, you might say, would not have been very pleased to be remembered as a linguist. What we see here is a very famous statue uh, in the heart of the city of Amsterdam, very near probably where Spinoza was born on the so-called Zwanenburg Wall. And uh, what you see here is, is a, a statue without arms. And when you see a statue without arms, you know one thing very, very, you know one thing for certain. This person is not a man, this person is an icon. Here you see Spinoza, the icon, the icon of diversity, witness the little birds and the roses on his cloak, uh, an icon of liberalism with a quote of, from the Tractatus, the purpose of the state is freedom on the base of this particular statue, the Iko Saeda, I have no way how you pronounce it in, um, in English, um, standing for his work as a grinder of lenses, but also his scientific rigor, but not a linguist. I'm not even sure Spinoza would like me to have this, uh, this, this lecture here tonight. He certainly wouldn't have liked the lecture, but I don't care, I have no choice. I will try and show you what I will do in these few minutes that I have at my disposal. I will, as I said, I'm an intellectual historian. I'm not a historian of philosophy. So I do not approach 
Spinoza's work as a work of as, 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 a, as a philosopher. There are great experts in that field. I am not one of them. I bring to the table my knowledge and expertise of grammar and linguistic philosophy. And that's how I will look at this very enigmatic work. And from this very enigmatic work, try to say something about Spinoza, try to get into his brain, if you will. How will I approach this? I will first look with you very, very briefly at 17th century Dutch Hebraism. If I would give a talk about that, that would be truly boring. But I, what I would like to try to point out is if you would go into a book, bookshop in the 17th century and buy a grammar of Hebrew to learn it, would the bookseller recommend Spinoza's grammar? And I can tell you, no, he would not. And we'll have a look why. We'll look at Spinoza's own Hebraism. When scholarship is divided on how long Spinoza attended school, but let's imagine that he went straight to the end. How much Hebrew did he know? And how had he learned it? And is it important for his grammar or for his compendium grammatices? A third point I would like to address is, um, and that's a more general point, scholars also, they all try to appro somehow appropriate Spinoza. Spinoza is a Jewish philosopher. He's not a Jewish philosopher. He's a modern philosopher. He's a secular philosopher. He's a religious philosopher. There is something inherent in his work that makes people appropriate him. And my question is, if we look at the grammar, where do we place him? And I think I know where to place him having read this little red book, I should add. The fourth point is basically, and I'm not going to dwell, dwell too long on it, is how did Spinoza do Hebrew grammar? Did he like writing the grammar? And my, my thesis is that he hated writing this book and that you can see it on every page. He thought, I would say, it was a pointless enterprise. And I will try to prove why I think I know um, that he thought so. And in the conclusion, we'll go back to this one question. What kind of a philosopher, thinker, scholar was Spinoza if we look at his grammar. So this is the program for tonight. I pictured a weather vane, typically Dutch weather vane that you find on the top of spires and towers in church towers in the Netherlands and gives the, the course of the wind. Grammar has very often been called the weather vane of sciences. When science changes, grammar changes. So you may think looking at grammar is boring, and to a certain extent, it is. And from a certain point onwards, it brings you straight into the heart of thinking, thinkers, brains, science, and scholarship. First, 17th century Dutch Hebrew scholarship. Here you find your average 17th century Dutch Protestant Hebraist. The guy on the left, Jakob Alting from Germany, working in the Groningen Academy. The right guy on the right, Johannes Leusden, um, slightly his junior, working in the Utrecht Faculty of Theology. If you look at the, these icons, believe it or not, the guy on the left is 27 years old. When I told my spouse, she could not believe it. She said, what? No, this is what, you, what becomes of you if you're a theologian. Jakob Alting, Johannes Leusten, the two great Hebraists, both complaining of the fact that during their lifetime, far too many grammars of Hebrew were written. They wrote them for their students. That's my next slide. These guys wrote these grammars for their students who more often than not, were not terribly eager to learn Hebrew. They probably also weren't terribly good at learning Hebrew. So these grammars had to be really simple. That's one thing. Another very important part of their audience was not found within the walls of the academy, but it was found in the homes, not just your average homes, but the homes of the so-called leisure class. You see them, the, the gentleman on the left, I'm, I'm Sure, I'm not quite sure if he'd be interested in Hebrew, but he's he's your average target audience of the 17th century Dutch Hebrewist, and certainly the lady on the right. There's precious little about women in this talk, I'm afraid, but it's an opportunity to introduce her to the global audience. She's the famous Dutch polymath of the 17th century, Anna Maria Schuurman or Anna Maria van Schuurman. It is told of her that she knew between nine and 11 languages, including Ethiopian and Arabic. So of course she knows Hebrew. If you see pictures of the lady, she's invariably depicted, portrayed with a book 
in her lap that usually she's not reading at the time. Eventually she got married to a guy who founded a religious sect and we never heard from her again. But in the course of the 17th century, grammars were dedicated to her because she exemplified the audience. And there was, there was even a Dutch physician for those of you who are from the Netherlands, I will say his name, Johan van Beverweg, famously forgotten, who actually said that women were far better at learning languages because they had fat brains. Well, I don't know about that, but we do know that for these fat brains, these grammars were written. What did they look like? Well, what they wanted to offer their audience, this the theologians on the one hand and the, the rich OTOs ladies and gentlemen who had very little better to do was offer them linguistic access to the divine truth, to give them a, enough Hebrew knowledge to read the Bible on their own and interpret the Bible on their own. Of course, very much a Protestant Reformation ideal. To this end, their grammars were always written in, not, not always, but if possible, written in the vernacular, in Dutch. Of course, Latin was the language, but these people wrote very often in Dutch, German, French. Leusden was translated into many European languages, actually. There was, it was almost a race. Who can, who can teach his or her, his students in the most, well, the most productive, but also the fastest way? And I think the shortest course in biblical Hebrew was six weeks. Well, I, I know of one treatise that says you can learn it in 24 hours. And the longest you took was about a year because that was about the span of concentration that your average OTO's lady had. So this was about quick learning, no redundancies, no complications, just quick, lean and mean grammars in Dutch. The method these grammars used, and I'm getting technical, but I'll keep it really brief, is a so-called analytical critical method. That meant you read a verse from the Bible, you looked up every single word, you tried to get the shoresh, the, the radix, the root, you looked it up in the dictionary, you found the meaning, and you knew what, and you knew how to translate the biblical verse. That's as simple as that. Reading, dissecting the grammar, looking it up in your dictionary, and then translate and know the divine truth from the original Hebrew. Um, and the idea was that from this grammar, you learned all the rules and all the regularities of the language, easy peasy. But sometimes, just occasionally, Hebrew was not so regular and it did not play by the rules. And then you would have a so-called anomaly or exception. And then these people would have a problem because where to find an anomaly in your grammar and where to find an anomaly in your dictionary. And this is a problem that Spinoza tackled, I'll show you in a second, Spinoza tackled and solved and nobody listened to him. That's what usually happens to geniuses. Um, were these treatises innovative? Well, they were in the sense that they tried to be quick, in the sense that they were written in the vernacular and in the sense that they reached a new lay target audience. But when it comes to new insights into Hebrew grammar, no. They all were built on a grammar, or on the grammatical tradition founded by the guy that you see on the right, the famous Swiss, Swiss theologian and Hebraist, Johannes Buxdorf. He, he, he was the, you might say, the, the chief deliverer of Hebrew categories, definitions, classifications, grammar, and lexicon for the Dutch 17th century. All you did was basically pillage his work, rewrite it, publish it, and have another book sold. And between these books, Spinoza's grammar would stand. How did Spinoza learn Hebrew? Not via these Dutch bourgeois grammars, you might say, but if he learned it, he learned it via school the famous Talmud Torah school that was so famed throughout the Jewish diaspora for its Hebrew education. But I have a point about that to make. If Spinoza actually made it right to the fifth class, he will have learned grammar from this book. This is a copy from 1728, so way after his death, copied for those who may have known of him by the famous Amsterdam um, yeah, literatus, man of letters, David, David Franco Mendes in 1728. You see how beautifully this is done. 
um, one of the manuscripts from the famous Eitzheim Library, of course, in Amsterdam. And this work is called Melechet Hadikduk. And for those of you who know Hebrew, you will immediately recognize that this book is called Ars Grammatica in Hebrew, Melechet Hadikduk. The author was an Amsterdam rabbi, the Amsterdam rabbi Isaac Aboab da Fonseca, who was hired to teach Hebrew in the school. And there were, well, there, of course there were grammars, but these people who were hired to write the grammars for the school wrote them especially for this particular school education. And we know what these books looked like. This is, uh, well, you might say the competing grammar not written by Isaac Aboab da Fonseca, but by his colleague Menashe ben Yisrael. You see his picture right on the left on the top. This is the so-called Safa Bora. It's in manuscript, as you can see. And you see a typical boys' school book where boys doodle, where they, well, when they are bored, they start writing. And this particular copy apparently belonged to none other than the famous Amsterdam rabbi, Shlomo Dolivera, who would later not leave the community, unlike his brilliant co-pupil Spinoza, but who would actually become a rabbi and write beautiful or well, tolerable Hebrew poetry. What you can see, here is that the language of instruction is Portuguese. And if you had a closer look, and I will spare you the details, but if you'd have a, have a closer look, you would see that these grammars are not complete, but that they sort of fill out the gaps in the school education. And if you look on the, on the, on the left, the bottom, you see in beautiful Latin script, finis laus deo, which I think is still somewhat well, telling of the former Christian, new Jewish background of this group. So these are Portuguese grammars written by local Portuguese Jewish rabbis. They are written according more or less to the Latin school tradition, but they follow the teaching program of the Talmud Torah school. And how did the Talmud Torah school program, what did it look like? Well, they had six grades, and there was a, and this was really quite innovative in Jewish teaching. They had a clear division into grades and steps that you took while going through the, uh, through the grades. In grades one to four, this, this whole program has been reconstructed already ages ago. Um, if you entered school, you learned from the very beginning, the, or in the very beginning, the Aleph Bet. It was called Kriya, to read, and you learned the Aleph Bet. The next step was not an immediate continuation of, well, doing something with the Aleph Bet, but it was learning something about the Parashat HaShavua, the weekly portion. And that's, to me, is interesting because it means that you didn't do anything with language, but you actually did something with the Torah portion of the week that was read in synagogue and that you were supposed to understand, not in its grammatical detail, but in its spiritual teaching or its theological teaching or its rabbinic teaching. So after the Aleph Bet, the next thing you did was learn what the Parashat HaShavua was about. You didn't go on and read it yourself. The next step would be, uh, and it was called in the, in, the, in the program, Torah Em Tahamim, which meant that you learned to chant, to cantillate Torah. And this was more or less the way it was also done in Ashkenazi schools with the Zarka tables, and this is for experts, let me not go into detail here, but the idea is that you learned the Aleph Bet, you learned the Parashat HaShavua, and the next step you took was you learned how to um, cantillate the Torah, the, the Parashat HaShavua, of course. The next step would be to learn Torah M Ladino, Torah with Ladino, Torah with a translation. They, and, and I, I'm, I'm particularly interest, interested in the way it's phrased here because it doesn't say that they learn to translate Torah, but they learn the portion of Torah alongside a translation. Maybe not so very different from the way it was done in Ashkenazi schools where you got the oisret from the Malamed who read to you the Yiddish translation. And then finally, in grade four, you would not only do the Torah, but you would also do Haftarah and Rashi. And my point is, do they do grammar while taking these steps? No, they don't. There is no grammar while 
learning this. If you go to grade number five, that is when, you, and then you've already learned how to read, you know the Parashat Shavu, you can cantillate Torah, you know the translation, you even know Rashi's explanation, but you haven't had a word of grammar. It is dissociated from the reading uh, and translation process in grades one to four. It's not integrated. And that, mean, and that says something about the Hebrew competence. That says something about the way you get the language, as they say in Dutch, into your fingers, how you get a grip on it. So grades five to six, you're being taught grammar by none other than the great Yitzhak Aboav. You learn the, how to write a drasha, the sermon for Sabach, and that is Menashe ben Israel who teaches you. And then a lesson that I would have greatly feared because it was taught by the formidable Shaul Levi Mortera was the Lisao Grande de Gemara, the great lesson in Gemara. Only then would you go to Gemara. And this program was witnessed by travelers, for example, by Ashkenazi travelers who would say how revolutionary people start with Torah and only then go to Gemara and they learn grammar. But my point is they learn grammar relatively late and they learn it dissociated from the learning process. And precisely what that says about the, the, the measure in which Spinoza's grammar will have been Amsterdam Portuguese grammar, well, that makes it a bit doubtful for me. So this is the Talmud Torah program. We don't know how far Spinoza got. Some people say he dropped out because his name disappears from a list. But if he stuck to the very end, ended up with Mortera doing Gemara, he will have learned grammar dissociated from reading, learning how to read and translate the Bible. Very brief interlude after this technical story. One of the things I always have to keep reminding myself is those of you who've been in Amsterdam, you've been to the synagogue, um, all this did not take place, of course, in the beautiful Esnoga synagogue that you may have visited uh, on your travels to Amsterdam, but took place in the Houtgracht, and the, and the Houtgracht, a very Dutch thing to pronounce, the Houtgracht. Um, uh, a slightly different, smaller, earlier version where Judaism for these people still was new Judaism. I will not go into this background. It was just to, well, to give you a bit of couleur locale. When thinking of Spinoza and his Hebrew training, do not think of the Esnoga synagogue, but imagine yourself in the Amsterdam Houtgracht, very, very close to the Meester Fischerplein, of course, but a different, more humble beginnings of the new community in Amsterdam. So far, so good. Spinoza's intellectual profile is a thing to have very briefly commemorate now. Um, so we've looked at 17th century Dutch Hebraism. We've looked at Spinoza's Hebrew training. So far, we can't really say anything about Spinoza's intellectual profile compared to these two parameters. In general, you might say that there are those colleagues who will also look at the grammar and say, Ah, but wait, here we see a typically Jewish philosopher. There are really three ways of approaching Spinoza's intellectual profile. One would be to mobilize him, you might say, for Jewish philosophy and for a particular subspecies of Jewish philosophy. And that would be, of course, his status as a former converso, a Marano philosopher. You see on the right a famous um, publication by Yirmiyahu Yovel who has claimed that the very fact that the Marano, who has highlighted, I should better say, the Marano heritage of Spinoza um, and has elaborated how the Marano experience, the crypto Judaism, the converted Judaism, the uh, public appearance versus private Jew Judaism has been of fundamental uh, and, and really ground yeah, breaking influence on Spinoza's philosophy. And that would make Spinoza's philosophy the philosophy of a Jewish Marano. Second group of colleagues will be inclined to highlight Spinoza's work as a Cartesian philosopher, as a follower of Descartes. And at first sight, it's very difficult to escape that impression. If you look at the right, you see an early publication by Spinoza published by one of his longtime friends Johan Rieberts, and it's an explanation of 
the, philosophy, the Principles of Cartesian Philosophy, published by Spinoza or by Rieverts, 1663. Simultaneously, we may conclude that his foremost works were all published either anonymously, the Tractatus, or posthumously. And this may mean that the Cartesians did not always feel terribly com comfortable with the roads that Spinoza took in his philosophy. Um, related group or a related stance on Spinoza's intellectual profile are those, especially Dutch colleagues, Diep van Bunge, for example, who pronounce Spinoza a thinker of the Dutch Republic, whose Tractatus Philosophi uh, Theologi Theologico Politicus, impossible to pronounce, pronounce it in English, uh, whose Tractatus was written very much in support of the great leader Johan de Witt, anti monarchist, bourgeois merchant, uh, a fighter for tolerance, and a liberal. Uh, liberal statesmanship. Um, I'll, yeah, I can say more about it, I won't, but we'll come back to the Cartesian profile, of course. Oh, and then there's the last one. You can say one thing about Spinoza, it's that he stands out as one thing mainly, and that is as Spinoza. Um, he His work has the kind of genius that seems almost to escape the collective effort of scholarship. If, you, if you're in scholarship, like, like I am and some of the colleagues who are present, what you try to do is you try to contribute to scholarship. And scholarship feels like a kind of a, a cumulative enterprise. I do my bit and then somebody and he picks it up and does his or her bit. Spinoza is not like that. Pete Steinbacher at some point says, Spinoza wrote because he had something to say. And when you read his work, that's really very much what you feel. He is not a man who's doing scholarship, who's joining the academic or the scientific enterprise. No, he is a man who has something to say. And because of that, it's that's why, yeah, because of that, it's so easy to, well, to say, I appropriate him for Jewish philosophy. I appropriate him for Cartesian philosophy. And Yitzhak Melamed in 2013, wrote a beautiful article on this, where he pictures how, how people appropriate Spinoza. It's called charitable interpretations and the political domestication of Spinoza, or Benedict in the land of secular imagination. And of course, secular modernity is one of the causes that Spinoza has been mobilized for. Um, beautiful example here in the, in the publication by Jonathan Israel, you see him together with Karl Marx, icon, not scholar, icon. Um, in a, a famous letter by Moses Hess, he features alongside Jesus of Nazareth as the savior of mankind, in this particular case, the savior of mankind by introducing him into modernity. In other words, Spinoza is being appropriated by, well, historians of Jewish philosophy, by historians of Maranism, of the Marano experience, by Cartesian philosophers, by people who want to place him in the Dutch Republican context, and by people who want to, well, basically rally him for the cause of secular modernity and liberal, well, maybe so-called liberalism. So these are intellectual profiles that go around. And well, what I hope to show after having looked at uh, the compendium is that Spinoza is as Spinoza goes. Here is a man who wrote because he had something to say. What did he have to say? And what place did the compendium take in that program? Because you can, you can I mean, if, if la donna mobile, woman is a sometime thing, Spinoza was not. Spinoza was as, I don't know, think of consistent. When Plato thought of consistency, I think he thought of Spinoza. He was a man who was so linear and was so consistent in his thought that he would never write a book he wouldn't want to write. He wrote a program and I listed here the two on the left, major works from that program, the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, where he writes about the tension between the freedom to philosophize and the cause of the Republic, freedom versus state. This is Spinoza's contribution to social state, sorry, to social contract theory, 
where in England, Hobbes wrote the Leviathan, Spinoza in the Netherlands wrote this, well, what has been taken a testament for liberal politics. The purpose of the state is freedom. Next to it, you see the ethics, the etica, with the very telling subtitle, Ordine Geometrico, I start speaking Italian all of a sudden, Demonstrata, demonstrated with mathematical, uh, in a mathematical fashion. A book about, if you look at the page of uh, the, uh, the, the, the content, the table of contents, a book about God, about nature, who is God, about the origin of the mind, about the origin of the passions that make, our, that make us weak, that make us suffer, about the servitude that we experience because of these effects and passions and, because, and of the power of the intellect in overcoming these passions to arrive at a state where we love God through our intellect and become infinitely happy. A treatise on social contract, republicanism and freedom, a treatise on God, nature, the mind and beatitude and a grammar of Hebrew, I thought I'll add a question mark. So that's what I did. I added a question mark. What's a grammar of Hebrew or not a grammar of not Hebrew doing in this project? Well, the first thing is what to look, what does it, where does it stand in Spinoza's idea on how to get knowledge? Does a grammar help you to get knowledge? Well, the very quick answer is no. On the contrary, if you ever want to know anything, don't learn a language, especially not Dutch, and don't buy a grammar. And I can, well, what I now summarize is very crude. And if there's any specialist, please put your fingers in your ears and don't listen to me for the next three minutes. For Spinoza, there were roughly three categories of knowledge and some were infinitely better than others. The first and best form of knowledge, and now we're going to do hardcore theory of knowledge or epistemology. The first category of knowledge was intuition. Something that you, it, it's a kind of knowledge that you get like a stroke of lightning. This is already a very, very bad uh, comparison in Spinoza's book, but I don't care. It's the immediate understanding of perfect ideas because your mind is in conjunction with God who is nature, or as Spinoza says it in the Tractatus, grasped by the mind alone without words or visions. Close your eyes, don't learn a language, and you'll have the best knowledge. The next form of knowledge is knowledge that we gain through one thing that all humankind has, reason. So it's, you might say, a natural fact, fac faculty. It's innate in every single member of the humankind race. Reason. We can reason. And that is, of course, immediate. It's no longer immediate, but it's a noble faculty. So the second second best also category of knowledge is not the knowledge that we grasp intuitively by this stroke of intellectual lightning directly from God, but it's by thinking. It's by applying mathematical reasoning, knowledge derived from common ideas, common ideas that are natural and therefore true. We let loose on them a mathematical, mathematical form of reasoning and we arrive at reasonable, rational knowledge, the way Spinoza wrote the Ethica, the Ethica More Geometrico Demonstrata. And the final, and that's of course for us the most important realm of knowledge, is that of opinions. And we have a king who's very famous for sometimes saying, well, you know, it's, it's just an opinion. And I wrote here false opinions, and I, I, I do the air bunnies, false opinion because Opinions in Spinoza's game are, of course, they are false. They cannot be anything but false. And that has to do with the fact that we, we form ourselves opinions because of experience and habit. Ah, I always see this or that, and therefore I know it to exist. And I always walk past that or that, and so I know it to exist. And those things we know to exist through experience come to us via the senses. And when, once they've entered us via the senses, and I'll, I'll explain it in a bit more detail in a second, our imagination starts making an image of it, 
which it stores in its memory. Now we are very far away from intuition and we're very far away from, um, from mathematical reasoning because what we see here is all work of the body, including the fact that language then serves to express these images that we make. I realize I'm being totally abstract, so I give an example. You know, as I would not people who listen and may not be as bright as Spinoza, at least I'm not. So what you see here is a cloud. It's the formula of the average cloud in the air. I'm thinking, you know, like this, not in Spinoza's days, but this is what you find in a modern cloud, lots of pollution. So this is the formula of a modern polluted cloud. And this is what you find. This is the true cloud. What happens when I see a cloud? This is what I see. And this sense impression is literally an impression. It impresses on my body. It makes an impression on my body. And what does my Im imagination do? It makes an image, not of that first line, but of that impression on my body. So now we're deeply, deeply, deeply entrenched in the body and in Spinoza's game, that's not good. And then comes language and language bestows a word. And I, I know that we have guests from around the globe. So think of your own language. It may not very well be cloud, the word that we attribute to cloud. So it's totally conventional. It's, there's no direct representation of philosophical truth in the word cloud, Hebrew anan, Dutch volk. Where's the, the, the representation of essential truth in this random attribution of idiom and vocabulary? And then what happens when I pronounce it with my body? I say the word cloud. How far away is that from the formula that we saw at the beginning of this sheet? And for Spinoza, the problem is that all this is not related to the mind, neither to the intuitive bit of our mind, nor to the rational bit that can reason in a geometrical or mathematical fashion. No, it's all, these are all, as he calls it, extensions of the body. If we return to the project, I decided to add a question mark to the compendium, yet another one. What does, if you, you're the guy who wrote the, the Tractatus, you're on the point of finishing the ethics, why write a grammar, or a grammar that's not a grammar, about language that will not bring you anywhere in relation to truth? The only thing that brings you to truth is conjunction with God. Why waste your breath? And, well, I think it was Stephen Nadler who said, well, he must have written it sometime around 1673, 1675. That meant that Spinoza had only four to two years to live. Why bother? Next point. I've talked about why it is futile to write when you're Spinoza, to write about language. Why then write about the Hebrew language, other than that everybody in the Dutch Republic who was anybody liked to write about the Hebrew language or learn the Hebrew language? Well, he, he's been very honest about this project of writing about the Hebrew language. And he did so in the Tractatus Theologico Politicus, where he gives a series of four chapters in which he totally debunks the Bible. The Bible, he says, is a corrupt document and he's intent to prove it from the Bible that he has on his desk. And he says, if I really, if I want to say something about what, what the Bible is like, I should begin by saying something about the language in which it's written. So I really should, devote in the Tractatus a chapter or a passage or a study to, well, the essence of the Hebrew language. But I'm not going to. And he writes very, very clearly why he's not going to. And he does it in at the beginning of this biblical criticism where he says, a perfect knowledge of the Hebrew language. Where is this to be thought? And when he says Hebrew language, of course, he means the biblical Hebrew language. And there are many reasons why he thinks he cannot do it. First, there is our inability to fully reconstruct the history of Hebrew. 
the, but besides that, the very nature and structure of the language creates so many uncertainties that it is impossible to devise a method which will show us how to uncover the true sense of the statements in scripture with assurance. Here's a man who says, if I want to write about Hebrew, I don't have a method. And this man is Spinoza. And if Spinoza doesn't have a method, he feels uncomfortable. So the next line that I didn't quote is, so I will pass it over for the moment. I won't do it right now. What was his problem? Well, his problem was manifold. He didn't like Hebrew, but he's, he had two major problems. And the first was that the Hebrew Bible as we have it, according to him, was a corrupt document. It was not an original authentic document of the Hebrews, but it had been appropriated by generations of rabbis, Pharisees, he's pretty ugly and pretty nasty about the Pharisees, who have all done their thing. The Masoretes who added all the Nikud, all the vowel signs and all the accents, they had nothing better to do. He calls them the Otiosi Masoreti, the Masoretes who had nothing better to do. And the only thing all these generations did was take the Hebrew Bible further away from its authentic origins. So to write a grammar or a, a, any, any statement, he would call it a historia, an, a, a real analytical deductive study of Hebrew was impossible because the material was simply not authentic. It was corrupt. So what you could do was write a book about a corrupt manuscript, but you could not write a true book about a true nature of true Hebrew. So he'd rather not do it. And he said to make it worse, the Hebrews, the ancient Hebrews of biblical times left us no dictionaries, they left us no grammars, so we have no idea what it was like. He is empty handed and he doesn't want to write a grammar of Hebrew and he says so in his Tractatus and he says, I won't do it because I can't find a method. But there's also good news because as I try to point out earlier, there are three kinds of knowledge. So there's also maybe an idea to read the Bible through intuition. And that is what he also writes a few chapters down the line in the Tractatus, chapter 12, famous and a beautiful chapter uh, on the sacredness of the divine word and why the Bible is sacred after all, even if it's as corrupt as, well, your average English tabloid newspaper. He says it's one thing to understand scripture and the mind of the prophets, because for him, scripture is a product of the prophets and the prophets are all imagination. Muddled thinking, muddled Hebrew. No, no reason at all to want to read what they write. So it's one thing to understand scripture and the mind of the prophet, but it's quite another to understand the mind of God, which is the very truth of a thing. And then he says something very valuable, um, and this is also very mathematical. Simplicity, according to Spinoza, is truth. So if you re read, this, read this Hebrew Bible and it's all muddled and it's difficult and you have to learn a crazy language and it still makes no sense, then you know you're reading rubbish. But as soon as the Bible says something very clear and understandable, then you know that it's God speaking and that it is the truth. And for Spinoza, the truth of the Bible is a very simple one, a very straightforward one. We read it in Vayikra, in Leviticus, of course, but it's, again, for him, the universal rule of natural religion. That's how he calls it, a universal rule of natural religion. And that is the essence of the law, to love God above all and one's neighbor as oneself. And he says that the Bible expresses very clearly. And for that, the Bible is a sacred text. For that, you do not have to learn Hebrew because Hebrews, oh, those are the ramblings of the prophets. You only have to open your heart. This is, uh, Spinoza would say, the message of the Bible that is written on the heart. You don't have to learn Hebrew. Simply open your heart and your intuition. And then he says these beautiful last lines which really close the idea of writing a grammar of Hebrew. Scripture would be no less divine even if written in other words or in a different language. The language is a shell. It is less than a shell. It's the very truth 
of universal natural religion to love God and your neighbor that you can cull from the Bible. You might say with your mind's eye, not with your reader's eye. So if we think of his contemporaries, of Lowston and of the young Alting, who when he was 27 already looked as if he were 52, who wrote for theologians and who wrote for the OTO's leisure class and for, well, learned women. All those people try to get access to the divine word via Hebrew. Spinoza says, forget Hebrew, Put, flush it down the drain. We don't need it. Open your heart and you will know the truth of the divine word. So I added another question mark to the compendium in the project. It's not just a, uh, in, in sense of adding knowledge, it's a futile project, but in the sense of getting closer to any truth, biblical truth, it's also a futile project. Very briefly, this is a technical bit, and I'll keep it very briefly. If, if you would enter a bookshop and you would buy a book about grammar, any grammar, the book about grammar in the 17th century, you would, write, re, you would buy the book in the middle. The Aristarchus de Arte Grammatica by a guy called Gerardus Fossius. Um, we know that Spinoza had this book. And I can tell you, if he read it, you can't tell from the compendium. So he may have read it, he may not have read it, he probably couldn't care less, but he had the book in his house. And the only reason I show it is because it's such a beautiful counterpoint to what Spinoza does in his grammar. Gerard Fossius says, what is grammar about? It's an ars pure loquendi. It's an art to learn people how to speak properly. And what is to speak properly? To speak properly is to speak like the erudite people like himself look him at the picture he's an eruditus he looks like a dutch bourgeois gentleman with his big collar he's surrounded by books great and small he's leaving leafing through them he represents the consensus eruditorum the, the erudite guys this is a very normative way of approaching language this is how language should be and this is how it should be studied. An ars pur eloquendi, consensus eruditorum. You learn rules, you learn what words mean, and if you find a text that doesn't comply with your grammar, you correct the text. Who cares? Because you know better, you're the grammarian. So this is what we call prescriptive grammar. It prescribes what you have to do. It has a very clear benchmark. Only the best literature, the Dantes, the Homers, the Shakespeare of this world, they determine what language is and they determine what a grammar should be about. And if a thing doesn't apply, uh, comply with grammar, it's wrong. It's an anomaly. It's an exception. That is not what Spinoza does. Spinoza is not interested in the consensus eruditorum. He is in the compendium not interested to prescribe people how to do Hebrew. What he wants to do, and this is a term that he employs for all research that he does, he wants to write a historia of Hebrew. He wants, and yeah, you can call it the history. It really is very close to the Greek historian. He wants to search the true essence of Hebrew. And what you do is you take the Bible, and in his case, he does it uh, grinding his teeth because it's a corrupt document, and you look what the language offers you, and that is your basis, not what language should be, but what language actually is. In Latin, you would say ex usu lingue, on the basis of linguistic usage that you find in your sources. That's, it's like nature. You can't say how what nature has to look like. You can only study nature and deduce from what you see what nature is about. So he doesn't work with rules. Forget it. He uses the same neutral rational categories that he uses to describe the ethics and the mind and God and nature. For Spinoza, the whole of science is one project. Grammar is no exception. He doesn't look at signification or forms, he looks at functional relations. I'll give an example of that in a second. And the interesting thing is because he doesn't do grammar, he doesn't have to make a distinction between morphology and syntax. 
So many, many people, this is, um, I'm sorry, I'm now getting on my academic hobby, hobby horse, but I have, a, I have a very private point to make. Um, people say the compendium is not finished because it doesn't have a syntax. But if you look at what Spinoza does in the compendium, he doesn't need a syntax. He just wrote a grammar that was not a grammar. So it didn't have to be syntax. So this is a finished book. This was all he had to say. He doesn't give prescriptive grammar. He does research. He doesn't give you norms, rules, meanings. He gives you the true nature of Hebrew and he gives you no rules. And the good news is when there are no rules, there are no exceptions. But he also knows that the people who will read his book will find the result ridiculous. And that's what he says quite a lot throughout his grammar, especially at the beginning, but also later on, he will say, I will now write this and this down, although I know, and this is a literal quote, although I know that you will find it absurd, absurdum. And the word absurd, absurdum, is something that cannot be grasped by reason. So I always think that this is Spinoza doing an, a nice private joke because Spinoza and not reason? No, this is hyper-rational, you might say, but it's the result to a 17th century nice lady like Anna. I, I sometimes try to picture what Anna von Schuurman would have said, and she probably would have taken and said, oh, nice, and put it aside because it wouldn't help her. I give three examples. Um, first of all, famously, when you write a grammar, you distinguish particular parts of speech. Aristotle laid the foundation and he says, there's the noun, there's the verb, and there's the particle. And those are the three basic constituents of any language. And the Latin school tradition has elaborated, need not concern us here. What does Spinoza do? He is not a grammarian, so he says, I don't do this. I don't distinguish any parts of speech. I call everything a noun. Imagine, I walk, apparently all nouns. I sit, I sleep, I beat my wife, all nouns. I'll give you an example. And this is for those of you who are good at Hebrew. Those of you who are not, just believe me that I'm showing you some absurd examples of Hebrew. The Hebrew word for house is bait. If you put the definite article, the house, you will say habait. And in grammar, you will say this is a noun plus a definite article. No, nope, says Spinoza, because he doesn't recognize articles. He says, no, this is a nomen indicativum. This is a special function of the noun. There is no such a thing as the word ha or the or le la le in French. There is no, there's just nouns in Hebrew. And if it has this ha before, it is a nomen indicativum, not a noun with an article. The preposition alecha over you, as in haplishtim alecha, the Philistines come over you, what um, Delilah says to Shimshon, alecha. For us, it's a preposition with a suffix, second person, singular. For Spinoza, it's a noun, al, and uh, everything that's a suffix or a pronoun like I, you, he, her, him, she, they, those are all adverbs. And so he says, alecha is not a preposition with a suffix, it's a noun, because everything is a noun, and it's in the smichut, that's what explains the funny yod in the middle, and it has an adverb in the genitive. A word like katafti, I wrote, is not a verb, in the first person singular, but it's an adjective, katav, I write, plus the adverb, the pronoun, in a nominative because I'm the subject. So where we recognize a definite article, a preposition and a verb, he recognizes nouns, nouns, nouns. And the only reason I show this to you is that you will probably say, but that's absurd. And in a way it is, but if you read the compendium from cover to cover, it's total genius, because it doesn't allow for exceptions. And I think that will have felt particularly good to Spinoza. I'm nearly there. The final example that I really want to share is he solved the problem of the present. We all know that when Aristotle started measuring time, there was this line, there was the past, the present, and the future. The past was pretty clear, the future was pretty clear, but the present was always moving, quite complicated. 
what does Spinoza do? He says, well, if I look at the noun, because it's not a verb, it's a noun, but this particular function of the noun, I do not recognize the present. I recognize the past that includes the present, and I recognize the future that also includes the present. So he either includes the present with the past, which of course, in a certain way it is, or he includes it with the future, which it also always is. And I will not bore you, especially not because it's three to three to nine in Israel, and I don't know what time it is in other places of the, of the, of the world. But the very interesting thing here is that he really solved a couple of intricate problems in the Hebrew verbal system. The biblical Hebrew verbal system is notoriously difficult. You can present, you, you can express the present in many different ways. And if you follow Spinoza, you have totally nailed it. You've totally explained it. No exceptions, no weird things, nothing absurd, really. So brilliant. But did, it, did anybody ever, ever follow his advice? No. If you ask me, uh, in all respects, this compendium as part of the Spinozan project was very much part of his project in that he approached language exactly the same as he did politics or ethics, God, nature, knowledge, or the mind with the same apparatus. The apparatus was that of Latin linguistics, but no uh, Hebraist, no Latin linguist, not Fossius, not Lerster, not Alting will have recognized it. He did it his own way. And the irony, I think, is that though he did it in a way that suited his project, the very initiative of writing the grammar did not suit his project. He did not have an authentic corpus of which to write the historia, the history. It had no philosophical urgency. You didn't learn anything from learning the history of this language. It had no theological urgency because the true word of God you would grasp via an altogether different route of intuition. It does not tie in the grammar with Christian Hebraism, although it employs its terminology. It is, I think if Aboav or Menashe ben Yisrael will have read, might have read, I mean, uh, Aboav might have read it, would have read this compendium, they would have raised their eyebrows and said, well, we, we didn't do that harem for nothing, he's a weirdo. This is a total stand alone book. But then what did Spinoza say about true excellence? I think he, he gave the qualification himself. The end of the ethics, I think, gives away what the Spinozan project is about. Which tradition does he fit into? Does he fit into the Jewish philosophy? Nah. Does he fit into Cartesianism? It's like Latin Hebraism. He uses the terminology, but the Cartesians were a bit afraid of his results. They were too radical. In that sense, uh, I think Jonathan Israel is right in postulating a radical, maybe not a radical enlightenment, but simply radical thought. Um, but then Spinoza himself said, and I think those better be the last words of this lecture, all things excellent are as difficult as they are rare. And I think that's the only real label that we can put on this funny grammar that's not a grammar about a language that not a language. If it learns us anything, it learns us that Spinoza was to a large extent a standalone genius who is appropriated by many, many thinkers, currents, political, philosophical, and otherwise. 60 minutes to the second, well, almost to the second. So I would like to stop here, maybe also stop sharing my screen. I see Elke Morlock, what a pleasure. Wow, Professor Sweep, thank you so much. That was fascinating, and there were so many comments and and uh, co and compliments in the chat, um, and many conversations uh, erupted here. Um, I'll start reading some questions out, if I may. Yes, please. Yeah, I, it, it's. I, I can only say it's so difficult to do this for an audience that you can't see. I, I don't know if you fell asleep or went to have a coffee. So, I, if if it was boring or too long or whatever, or beside the point. And maybe, all, it, maybe one thing, maybe it was all not true. Maybe I'm just postulating something and Spinoza would come from heaven and say, nah, woman, go to that kitchen. 
wrong. I don't know. Let's we, we can have a talk about that as well. <laughs> there were constant consistently uh, about 300 people here throughout the lecture and uh, from the compliments in the chat, everyone enjoyed themselves very, very much. And I will send you the chat transcript so you can see all the compliments. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, Shaul asked, uh, has the Spinoza document been translated into English? The compendium, I think, no. But, oh, that will be a brilliant, <laughs> maybe that would also be a brilliant waste of time. Uh, no, it has not. No, and, and I, I, I wrote an article about it and that has appeared in French of all languages. And I thought it was very Spinozan to have it published in French. No, it has not been translated, no. Oh, a bad translation, I read from Steve. Hello, Stephen. Um, uh, Arno also asked if it was translated into Dutch. Was it? Gosh. There you, the, I, I, I'm afraid I can't, I can't tell. Um, Haley asked if Spinoza um, uh, studied the Torah portions as well. Um, well, I think we have Steve in our midst, so he, he's the great biographer. If um, Spinoza as a boy went through the Talmud Torah school and he went to second grade, yes, he did. Yeah, and he did that as Torah portions. Yeah, definitely. And that would be through a rabbinic lens. We know, for example, that Menashe Ben Yisrael, probably also for the courses that he taught or for the, the, the classes that he taught in the Talmud Torah school, wrote a book uh, where he says, um, if you want to speak in the course of giving a drasha on this or that or that or that topic, look into this book and you'll find all the midrashim that you want for it. So there was a clear reference, where I think it was published, Pnei something, I forgot the name, published 1628. So there was a, a clear midrashic take on studying Parashat HaShavor, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, well, there's so many questions. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this name right, but Lib Libu or, or, or Libu uh, asked, uh, Spinoza didn't really control any of the seven languages he spoke. His Dutch was very basic. How did Spinoza uh, have the chutzpah to write the compendium? Grammar. Yeah, how did he have the chutzpah? I, I think this would have been a question that Spinoza might have very well have loved. Um, the thing is, what he if you look at the way he writes his compendium, you don't but let, let me say one very generic thing, and I, do, I hope I'm not offending any linguists who are right now present in the audience. I know many linguists in Amsterdam who do functional grammar on, for example, collected Amerindian languages without speaking any of those languages. So in modern general linguistics, it's very usual, it's very usual to have a corpus or a, a, a set of corpuses in languages that you do not know. And I think if you look at the way Spinoza approached Hebrew, I think he, um, he had a smither, a smither he, he must have had, but having a competence in Hebrew was not necessary for doing the kind of exercise he did on the Hebrew Bible. That's what maybe also allowed him, not, not the fact that he didn't have Hebrew, but the fact that he needn't have Hebrew. It would only get in the way. So um, he, he's a bit like a modern general linguist, but from a Cartesian, somehow Cartesian background, a very Spinozan Cartesian background. And it's, it's, it's in a way it's chutzpahdik. And, and my feeling very much is that Spinoza did not enjoy writing it. And every time he wrote, what I now write is absurd, of course, within its own, very geometrical thinking, it was not absurd, but for the 17th century reader, it was weird. And also it didn't get a follow up. Nobody thought, ah, now this takes grammar into a completely new direction. Now, henceforth, we're really going to deepen this knowledge. No, this is what happens very often when you're a genius. You're not in touch with current debates. You do your thing, as Pete Steinbacher says, he's a man who had something to say, and then you die and people, yeah, it's, it's what Socrates says, never write down anything because people take you and they appropriate you and they misinterpret you and they misrepresent you. And that's partly what sometimes happens to Spinoza, but his grammar, no follow up. So yes, a good spin, I think everybody thought it. Thank you very much. Um, Ralph asked, what was Spinoza's uh, motivation for this? 
I don't know, maybe Steve knows. I think Steve in his book wrote that uh, friends asked him. And then I thought, but if I were a friend of Spinoza and I knew his work, I would never ask him to write a grammar because I knew I wouldn't need it because that's what his work is about. Uh, maybe the people were just curious um, what he would do if he would write it. It doesn't really fit into, fit into the seriality of his project. Um, so this is something that really, really puzzles me. Really, really puzzles me. If you're a good friend of Spinoza, if you don't ask him to do this, you read the Tractatus and he says, I can't do this, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to skip it for now. And maybe people were too much in the Dutch mindset of, yeah, but we, you, you need, we need an alternative Leusden. We need to counter our alting. We need to show these people your program. I don't know, maybe that was the idea that was thoroughly ideological. I've broken my head over it. I don't know. Thank you very much. Um, Levana, Levana asked, uh, do we know what his childhood family language was? Uh, I suppose, it, well, again, these are really all questions that Steve Nadler, who's present, should answer because he's the expert. Um, I would say that his childhood language would be, Steve, type it in the chat, Sp Portuguese. This is one thing that Yitzhak Malamet, whose article I quoted on one of the sheets, uh, he also said, um, the way you, the way you, you uh, speak to Spinoza, whether you choose the word Benedictus or Baruch or Bento, already somehow betrays in which camp you want to draw him. He may very well never have called himself Baruch. He always publishes as Benedictus. And Bento... What's, uh, what's Steve's last name so I can let him uh, open his microphone? Yes, please. Oh, yes. Go ahead. What's his last name? There are a few uh, students Nadler. here. Sorry, Nadler. Because that's really the expert on biography. I'm not. Steve, I do language. Stephen Nadler, you can open your microphone if you so wish to. I well, hope first of all, I'm, I'm flattered to be mentioned by Irene. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm all red. You're not. So that's good. <laughs> oh, uh, definitely Portuguese. Um, and um, we don't, so we don't really know what he called himself in casual conversation. The only reason we call him Benedictus is because in Latin works, where it's always B de Spinoza, yeah. the initial. Um, whenever he's writing in Latin, he signs it as Benedictus. But you know, if you're meeting him at the uh, at the Hrumacht, would you call him, "Hey Bento, how's it going?" <laughs> you wouldn't nev certainly not say, "Hey Benedictus, old guy, how are you doing?" No. no but you also wouldn't say, "Hey Baruch," that you wouldn't. So no. if Klausner says Baruch or anybody says Baruch, it, it's it's a statement, and that's also what what Yitzhak Malamed writes, and a really very uh, a, a much recommended article about appropriation, not just of Spinoza but of many other great thinkers. Thanks, Steve. I'm very honoured that you're here. <laughs> oh, it's been wonderful. Thank you. So there was one uh, uh, one more question that I'll read out, and then uh, after that I will open microphones so that if anyone has any further questions or any remarks or just to say thank you, they can. Um, Adam asked, Spinoza's approach resonates with uh, pseudo-Dionysian uh, mm -hmm. concepts of number one, negative theology of proving something by saying it can't be proven, and two, the concept that divine wisdom trickles downward through corruption of language, senses, etc. cetera. Uh, do you feel that there's a connection or influence here? Oh, I'm always very, very hesitant to, uh, to use the word influence. Although you never know, this is something I would. This is a, it's a great question, and this is of course the question always about parallel thinking, uh, echoes, influences, uh, coincidence. Um, if if I'm 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 being as rigid as Spinoza himself was, I would say um, this is so deductive what Spinoza does that there is no there's no room for outside influence. So methodologically, there's no room for uh, inspiration. Well, there, there, there may be room for inspiration, but um, so in this particular case, I would really have to read pseudo Dionysius. I would have to read Spinoza again. Gut feeling would be, this is so idiosyncratic, so standalone. I'd be interested in the parallels, but I'd be hesitant to go further for now, but it's a great thought. Thank you so very much, Professor, Professor Zweep. Uh
I will open microphones so that people can say thank you and ask any more questions that anyone has. Thank you again, Professor. Uh, thank you all for being here and Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Very, very interesting. Thank you. It was great. Avri, I hear your voice and I also saw Daniela. So there's some people I know, some people I don't. So. Does 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 uh, Spinoza did Spinoza fundamentally disagree with the idea that I that I've seen in in Hasidic Kabbalism that that the language of thought is is simply an internalization of spoken language? Ah, wow! Did internalization as a, as a as a matter of fact? Let me let me just elaborate on that a yeah. little bit, just slightly slightly because I think it's illuminating. Because they're on the same track of, of course, God relatedness, that 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 the significance of human speech is is understood as as actually exactly the spirituality of the human being as opposed to the physicality. Right. The ability to form in language meaningful content is not a material business it's a spiritual business yeah. you, Steve, and, question and that becomes clear. the link to the divine steve the question is clear thank you yeah um i don't know if arnold kerkhoff raised his hand to answer or to ask a further question uh, it was a new question a new question then let me i think uh, judging but but with, with what i saw from part of the ethics and the um the companion my answer would be Spinoza would have heartily disagreed because the conjunction with the divine in Spinoza takes place via intuition and is specifically without any interference of the body. And the body for him is the combination, you might say, of senses and imagination. That And the imagination is what yeah, goes to work with what the senses do to the body. And the body is to be overcome at all times. So here I think he would find himself very far removed from, from that line of thinking. I know of uh, also Jewish lines of philosophy that would not find themselves very remote from that kind of thinking. But I think standalone Spinoza would. Uh, Arno, because you're yes. done. <laughs> yes, I, I had an, uh, a question. It, it was yeah. It is again about about the Dutch uh, the Dutch version. You already replied to that that there is no it does not exist uh, nope. version of the compendium. But I was just wondering. Um, I mean, while well, well, Spinoza lived in the Dutch Republic, when when but let's say when the Opera Postuma were published, so the compendium were included uh, there in that publication. Yes. Yeah. But when uh, the Nagelaten Schriften have been uh, uh, released, uh, it was not in, in it. No. I was just wondering why, why, why has this compendium been skipped in, uh, in the Nagelaten Schriften? Nobody ever told me, so I, I can't say, but I can, maybe Steve has, so I'll, I'll ask Steve in a second. Um, I, I can say one tiny bit of circumstantial evidence. Piet Steenbakker's wrote an article on the audience, the first audience of the opera posthuma of, so let's say the, the people who, who were really waiting for the opera posthuma to uh, appear. And he, he's on the basis of one copy from a library from The Hague, he seems to have identified one reader and he heavily, this reader heavily annotated the ethics, but he only underlined two tiny lines in the companion. So he, he really intensively wrote, read the rest but in the companion, he just underlined two lines. And before I give the floor to Steve, who knows about it, the only thing that tells me is that the companion just didn't speak to this first reader, a, a contemporary of Spinoza. I forgot his name. It was not a very famous name, at least not to me. But Pete Steinbacher wrote about it, I think, in the 1990s. Um, the companion just didn't speak so much to this particular reader, maybe also not to the rest of the potential audience. But this is... I mean, this is not Spinoza reading it, reasoning. This is circumstantial evidence, and I would never condemn anybody to death on the basis of this. Maybe, Steve, you have. Thank you. Yeah, there's actually a, there's an answer to the question in the preface to the Opera Postuma and the Nachlade Schriften. 
uh, Spinoza's friends who put those works together said, we're going to include the Hebrew grammar in the Latin, but not the Dutch, because anybody who wants to learn Hebrew will already know Latin. So there's no point um, in including it in the Dutch as well. Yeah. Well, that's something about how adequate they thought it for other purposes than the Spinozan project. Yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting argumentation. Um, may I ask why grammatic case? Uh, you may, and I cannot give you the answer because I asked a question. It's it's I, I looked it up. The word grammatic case. I, I can again refer to Steve, but the problem is it's it's not a category in uh, uh, talking about grammar. Compendium, and then you would think grammaticis, a genitive, uh, or, but it says grammaticis, and nobody ever correct, no proofreader ever corrected it. It's, it's uh, for me, it's a hapax in Hebrew grammar. But in a way, I like it because this book's, book is a hapax, is a, a one-off in Hebrew grammar. It's disorienting. Hello, Professor, may I ask a question, please? Yes, of course. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was, it was a fascinating uh, discussion. Um, I'm pretty uh, new to all of this, so um, I should know, I guess, or many people would know. Uh, did he apply or would he have applied his thoughts about Hebrew grammar universally to all languages? He wouldn't waste his breath, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other guy that I showed, but this is boring to everybody, so uh, I'll keep that really brief, but the guy called Fossius, because there is, of course, there's in, in linguistics, there's always the, 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 the tension between the particular languages and their grammar and the, the, the rules that apply to languages universally. So that, that those are the two poles between you, between which you move. And uh, in that, already before that, but certainly in the 17th century, people were uh, uh, discovering something like universal grammar. That was not just a universal grammar of the mind, but a bit like Chomsky later in the 1960s, that all language had these universals that were in all languages. And the Fossius guy who wrote the Aristarchus that was actually on the bookshelf of Spinoza, he said there are two kinds of grammar. There are bits of grammar that apply to all languages and there are bits of grammar that apply to certain languages only. So that will be for Fossius to do, the real linguist, but not for Spinoza because Spinoza was not a linguist. He was the man who had this, uni, yeah, this unified agenda of universal science, you might say, through mathematical reasoning. That was his bit. So in a way, he would always do universal grammar. That was not grammar. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for the question. Hey, it's if it's good, sir. Sometimes pop up in the, on the pages, so. I see a hand raised by Mr. Kaplan, please. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I, I just muted him because there's a machine open and yeah. there's an echo going on. Yeah. So Lawrence, yeah. if you could turn that off and just uh, unmute and you can ask your question. Yeah, I, my, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Zeb Harvey suggested, I remember in a lecture once, that there may be some type of correspondence between uh, Spinoza's emphasis on the centrality of nouns in his grammar oh and his philosophic emphasis on God as being the absolute substance. I was just wondering what you think of this suggestion. Um, in principle, I agree with that suggestion. Yeah, I, I didn't want to raise it, but the idea that the idea that there is only the noun coincides with the idea that there is, um, well, Spinoza's belief in what, what he called substance monism, right? That's the point of Zeb Harvey. I think it's apt, uh, the only, Problem that I have with it, and and I I, I keep wavering. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm la donne mobile. I mean, Spinoza was consistent. I'm not. Is that when you recognize one part of speech, you basically recognize no parts of speech, and that means that you can't see the choice for the noun. You can see it as a parallel to substance monism, but it's not linguistic monism on the part of Spinoza because he doesn't recognize different parts of speech. He just recognizes speech. So I, I agree 
but I can't fully transplant, and this is a very technical answer. I apologize to everybody who says grammar, boring. Um, so I agree with Steve Harvey very much. I read the article and I have slight trouble transplanting it without forms to linguistic thinking. So. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm getting rather by the second, by the way. Irene, I was going to ask you a question by email, but it's so nice to have a face-to-face -face conversation. Yeah, we do it? yeah. Um, so I want, I want to make one little point and then ask you a question. So my little point was that this notion that there was not, there, there was not going to be a second part on syntax, um, that suggestion sure. also comes from the friends who wrote the preface. Yeah, sure. Ah, but that's interesting. Because yeah, they, I didn't understand what he was doing. Okay, good. I'm, I'm being That's, very I'm, arrogant now because implicitly I'm saying, I understand what Spinoza was doing and I'm the only one. And, and of course that's, that can be falsified and, and I, I invite everybody to do so. But if you look at what he does in this grammar and I really read the entire grammar and I assure you it's not a pleasure and you need lots of cups of tea and chocolates. Um, you know, he doesn't need a syntax because he covered syntax in using the entia raciones and establishing the functional relations in the text. And that's not what grammar does. Grammar in the 17th century is etymologica and syntax. It's morphology and syntax. In a way, sometimes it still is certainly in biblical Hebrew manuals nowadays. And he, he didn't do etymology, he didn't do the morphology, and he didn't do the syntax. He just did what he did. And that included syntactical thinking, you might say. And what? it's striking when the friends say there should be a syntax. I'm pretty sure Spinoza would have said, bugger off with your syntax. <laughs> I, I think too that your knowledge of Hebrew is so much better than theirs that you probably have a better argument for your case. But the question I wanted to, to push you on, so I agree with you entirely, this notion that Spinoza is like a Rorschach test. People see in him exactly what they want to see. Well, that's a beautiful one, yeah. And um, I, I also entirely agree that Yovel is wrong. First of all, Spinoza did not, was not a converso. He never went through the Murano experience. So to, to see his Jewish connection as through the Murano lens, I think that's absolutely wrong. So I totally agree with you. But would you also say that Spinoza's engagement with thinkers like Maimonides and Ibn Ezra and uh, Gersonides, and not just in the theological political treatise, but also in the ethics um, does, reveal a, a deep engagement with Jewish philosophy. And in some sense, the ethics can be seen as a kind of continuation of a rationalist project in medieval Jewish philosophy. I know, you know, I've argued for this before. So I just want yeah. to, I've never been heard what your response to it might be. Yeah. Um, well, I agree and I disagree, I think. Uh, and that is because I'm so totally convinced of the, 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 the thing that Pete Steinbacher says, this is a guy with something to say. And he had to say it. And it what he does is he uses everything he can find. And that includes the terminology of Johannes Buchstorff. That includes the terminology of a guy like Johann Hottinger. It may very well include Maimonides. Of course, um, the, um, Menashe in this, this book that I earlier referred to also engages with Maimonides. So sure he knew it and, and Lodewijk Meyer engages with Maimonides. They engage with it. No, that may, I, I would put it differently, Spinoza, uses it, I, I wouldn't even be entirely sure whether he engages with it. That, that's where I, I would have to read him again and be really careful. He uses everything and then he turns it inside out and he takes the husk or he polemicizes in the case of, for example, the metaphorical reading as contrast, contrary to the, the intuitive reading, for example. Um, I, I, I would like to have a coffee with you and talk about what engagement in this particular context, in, this, in the context of the Spinozan uh, project means. Because I, I, see, I see your point and I recognize it also from the point of view of grammar. I was at a conference 2016 in Paris uh, where we talked for ages about the compendium. You can talk two days about the compendium. You all want to go and have dinner now, but we talk for days about the compendium. And uh, people said, try to put it alongside David Kimchi. They put it alongside uh, uh, Abraham de Balms. They put it alongside Fossius. And you can do it. But, it, and you can probably do it alongside pseudo Dionysian. But the result is vintage Spinoza and nothing else. 
I, I couldn't disagree with that, of course. <laughs> Um, and I, I, I wouldn't suggest that he was, you know, just a Jewish philosopher because you're right too. There was there's the Cartesian context, the Republican context, the ancient Stoic context. Yeah. And I think these are all important frameworks. Yeah. Um, but that's yeah, what a great I, answer. yeah. What I find baffling is that the Cartesians I read that somewhere were really sometimes hesitant to accept his the most idiosyncratic of his his conclusions. And they so, attacked him. He called them the yeah. stupid Cartesians. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I, I once attended a lecture that was called The Jewish Genius. And that was maybe eventually modeled on Einstein, but it's about people who are so brilliant. And I, I know the Dutch word, and I don't know, maybe you, your Dutch is good enough to translate it for me into English. If you're a scholar, your work needs to have what they call in Dutch, aansluitingswaarde. It needs to tie in with other scholarships. I, I sometimes do not, I'm not a genius, but I, I'm sometimes interested in things that nobody likes. So my scholarship sometimes does not have this tie in value. And when I read Spinoza, I see him capitalizing on knowledge, but I see him being totally oblivious of this tie in knowledge factor. And I find that fascinating. And that's why I also, he, I think he invites not pupils, but devotees, groupies, guru worshipers. I mean, in, in, in the 19th century, Henri Kopp has written beautifully about this. He was totally appropriated by liberal Protestant theologians who wanted to get rid of the church, but wanted to remain pious. Spinoza saved them from being Protestant. So I think that that is his faith, to be a fate, to be a Jewish genius in that respect. Brilliant, 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 inviting, begging commentary, but really failing to inspire in the discipline itself. Well, thank you, Val. Tot ziens. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much for being here and, and for helping me out. Oh, that was wonderful. Thanks so much. If there is one last question in the chat that Federico asked. He asked, Does mod do modern linguists, uh, uh, someone like Chomsky, for instance, uh, who are familiar with Spinoza, have anything, uh, find anything innovative in his grammar? Oh, that's an interesting, I, I, I must admit that if I have read Chomsky, I have either omitted looking at any Spinoza reception or, um, or, or I've forgotten, I'm, I'm going to look into this and this is really nice, but I can say that many linguists have looked at one missing link. And this is really uh, technical. So those of you who think I was planning on going, I absolve you. Um, and that is the school of Port Royal. The school of Port Royal was a school in France that did a kind of, yeah, a kind of resuscitation of some kinds of speculative medieval grammar. Oh, you don't want to get me going on this and I, I won't. But people have noticed the link between or, or the inspiration Chomsky got from the Port Royal school, which was slightly later or more or less contemporaneous. And of course, there have been people who have tried to fit Spinoza into the Port Royal school. And I think it's it has been done brilliantly, but in my view, unsuccessfully. But it's, it's, it's something I'm going to look into. And somebody says, exactly, Chomsky was interested. Oh, I don't know if I can find it now. There's so much. Chomsky was interested in Port Royal and of course, Decker. Yeah, Cartesian linguistics, not Spinozan linguistics. Yeah. Thank you so, so much again, uh, Professor. Thank you all for being here. Um, once again, Lalita from Jerusalem. Yeah, well, thank everybody and also friends and non-friends and also for not zooming away because that's very disheartening. So thank you for staying and listening till the end. That was really nice. And thanks to Steve for his comments. And it was a pleasure. Professor Zweig, I just yeah. want to say thank you from Canada. Wow, yeah. Yes. It's lovely to meet people from Canada who are interested in Spinoza. So thank you. Uh, I, I have to, I, I'm returning to Spinoza after uh, almost 30 years out of university. And uh, I find uh, your, your uh, talk this afternoon, my time. Yeah. Um, yes, tremendously stimulating. Thank you. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm happy to be, well, instrumental in your return. <laughs> if, if anything is produced, I will be sure to footnote this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Avri, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are I'm you? Good to see you. Just saying hello to a yeah. 
a dear friend, and I'm very happy to see you. Yes, lovely to see you. I'm, I'm now as red as a lobster. It's really horrible. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, you, should would... be happy. you should be happy as a clam. I should be happy as a clam. That's nice. Yeah. It's yeah. daunting to speak for a, an audience that you can't see. But it's also nice to know that there are friends. Yes. Elke, I see. And I saw Daniela. And... Yeah, Javier, Javier was here. Oh, Javier was Katia. here. Yeah. Ah, uh... I missed them. Yeah. So Hello. I hear children in the background somewhere. <laughs> yes. Thanks. It Thanks. was great. Thank you, Irina. We miss you so much. Ah, how are you? Sorry, this is just family reunion, sort of, <laughs> but also very nice. Oh, it's and it's so nice to see you three. Are you healthy? Yeah. Thanks, God. Ah. Yeah. Ah, that's lovely. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to you. And this goes for everyone, of course. Yeah. If you have any questions, I'm still here. I'm always the last to leave a party. So um, T tell me, Irene. Um, yeah. I mean, we're discussing in the field very much this idea of intuition and Kabbalistic intuition. Is there any research going on in the present on this? specific topic you mean of spinozan intuition yeah and yeah. parallels to to i mean this direct access to the divine intellect or to the divine of course it's very close to either dvekut or to the yeah the union mystica and the intellectual union of mm -hmm. abulafia and uh, i do not know anybody who's currently doing research on this idea I, I think this would also, well, if, if you would do research on this, you, you'd really have to take into consideration, I'm, I'm repeating myself maybe a bit, yeah. uh, the Spinozan, uh, yeah, let's say the Spinozan constraints of the project. So it would really be about parallels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it would certainly not be about influences, but it could mm -hmm. be interesting to, uh, to have a comparison of Dvekut and Amor Dei intellectualis. Of course, yeah. for, for Spinoza, it very much was an intellectual love of the God. Yeah, I mean, you can always take the detour via philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so you do not speak about influence, but mm -hmm. we can see that we have very strong parallels between philosophical developments. I mean, of course, in Spain, medieval Spain, and then we have philosophical development in Amsterdam in the 17th mm -hmm. century. So of course it's not it's not uh, an influence, but it's very interesting to see parallel developments. Of course, also in the Christian camp with this the Amor de intellectualis mm -hmm. and this union or intuition, also in Christian mysticism of medieval Spain. Yeah, yeah. If, if you can say one thing, uh, one of my one of my hobby horses is that I. Because what I said right in the beginning, I like to look into people's brains. And I, I would really just love to crack open the skull and, and then see what somebody thinks. And mm -hmm. what I'm pretty sure is that the whole apparatus of modern scholarship is not there in the 17th century. The whole compartmentalization mm -hmm. of knowledge and of disciplines that we have uh, it, it is not there. For example, if my, my students write about Maimonides, and they say Maimonides was a philosopher, a halachist, and physician. I say no. Maimonides was a gentleman who traveled the world and wrote books that we now categorize as philosophy that we might, although I would never say Mishnah Torah is halacha, it touches upon halacha, but it's not halacha, it's an altogether different work that has to do somehow with halacha, but not in a halachic way. And, he's a, and he wrote on the pearls, the mega pearls, and, and, and things. But you can't say he was a philosopher and, it was, and, and maybe Spinoza also either still in an early modern way or by the very fact of his own idiosyncratic program, he defies modern categorization. Mm -hmm. And if you ever want to do a, a, a kind of a parallel project, there's always this danger of parallelomania. Don't do this. Don't just draw random parallels. But maybe Spinoza, because of who he was in the period and his defiance of compartmentalization, 
again, substance monism, you might say. Maybe he, he can invite actually comparison, but only for a methodological cause, of course. Mm. Yeah. I'm getting really very into my own talk right now. <laughs> yeah, but I hope, I hope this helps. Ah, thanks. Thanks. Very helpful. Yeah. Organ and you have to organize the thing on Satanov, who's not a genius as Spinoza, but if you talk about compartmentalization and Haskalah, that would also be an interesting one. Compartmentalization of, of, of knowledge in the 18th, the Jewish 18th century. Yeah, but the, I mean, this is exactly the point. Yeah. You, you're looking for the universal. Yeah. So the compartmentalization is, is not the aim. I think also not in no, no. I, I, What I meant was go for the universals beyond the compartmentalization. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond the and because compartmentalization is anachronistic. Yeah. I now have a PhD student who's going to write uh, what he hopes to be a new book on the Kusari, where he says, I'm not going to read this as philosophy, Yudha Levi, I'm not going to read this as philosophy, I'm not going to read this as religious philosophy, I'm not going to, read, uh, I'm just going to read it as the Kusari and then see what comes out. And it's, and it, and he's going to compare it with dialogical Latin literature. It's interesting in a way, mm. but it's difficult. The most difficult, we have this whole apparatus of lenses through which we've been taught to watch. And if you want to go to people, to the roots of people's brains, you have to, I mean, it's in the presence of Spinoza, talk about throwing away lenses, but that's what you have to do. You have to throw away your lenses. I think that's exactly also the point with Satanov. It's all on the same level. And he doesn't mind if he talks about the blood or the Svirot or the, the camera obscura, it's all on the same level. Yeah. yeah. And one, completes the other and one is appropriated to the other that's why it makes it's, it's made so easy to appropriate these people because everybody has his or her own angle and hermeneutics and the symbols and whatever the rhetorics is so full and flexible that it's an, op an open book yeah yeah and of course this is really just before the 19th century which as Foucault says really witnesses the, the definitive compartmentalization of science and, and of academia. Yeah. yeah, so it's for, for a guy like Satanov, it's still possible to have this unified program of science where you can, you know, where you can do contemporary stuff, but you can also re-edit the Nicomachean ethics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah, have well, to meet on Satanov. <laughs> sorry? We have to meet on Satanov again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and he's really the mirror, I mean, he's the, the, the total, other end of the scale from Spinoza. Spinoza's worshipped, Satanov is not. He's eclectic or whatever, yeah. He's wearing the wrong clothes. Yeah. Okay. I, I once had a colleague, we were in Philadelphia and there was a colleague, Kathy Ratsch, and she had a talk and it was called The Looks of the Learned. And it was what you could say about uh, how people are choose to be photographed or how they are being depicted, for example, in statues, how they are being perceived or how they're trying to be perceived. And you could really, uh, I think, write a monograph, and maybe there's somebody present who would like to do that, the looks of Spinoza. There are so many paintings, portraits, it would be so, it's, it's a disastrous piece of work, but it would be interesting to see how, uh, my favorite one, of course, is Mendes da Costa, who has him in his, his robe, his house robe, looking really heimish and happy because he has achieved beatitude through the intellectual love of God. I always tell my students that when I leave the academia, I want to have one of those, a replica of the little, it's a little figurine. And I want it, it's my favorite Spinoza, the looks of the learned, yeah. We'll do our best. <laughs> So everybody's now sort of not leaving the party. That's, uh, but I, I will be shortly and go to have a pizza. Thank you all so, so much. Lelato once more. Yeah, Lelato. You deserve it. Long.